I'm always a little daunted to try to describe in about a half an hour uh, the result of um, 20 years uh, work on the nature of the American trial and a couple of books that I wrote uh, out of that. And um, so it's daunting, uh, but then it's sort of dispiriting to realize I really can do that. I, I can pretty much sum it up in a half an hour. Um, and that's what I'm going to try to do uh, uh, today. Um, my focus has been on the, uh, the meaning of the trial's death for us. Uh, if the American trial is dying, and I'll tell you why I think that's a fair metaphor, uh, so what? What difference does it uh, make? And what I've been doing is basically appealing to the American public and to the legal profession not to let that uh, happen, not to try to explain it. I think the trial and, uh, is one of our great cultural achievements, stands in a rich tradition. Uh, admired by those people who are closest to it and are in a position to know about it. Uh, and, and Clarence Darrow was, of course, one of the great icons about of the possibilities that are embedded in this institution, which is in many ways unique uh, around the, the world. Uh, I think its loss would wound our public culture and certainly our legal culture. Uh, federal Judge uh, William Dwyer out west uh, wrote that the jury trial is the canary in the mine shaft of our democracy. Uh, if citizens lose interest and ability to do justice in court, a general loss of democratic governance uh, would follow. Uh, if the trial dies, it would not be by a tyrant's axe, but, along a, but through a long and scarcely noticed process of decay. And I'm going to describe why I think that's, that's a fair description of what, what is going on here. Uh, indifference in the long run, he writes, is deadlier than any coup, and democratic institutions are easily lost through neglect, followed by decline, and then abandonment. Uh, as one other judge put it recently, democracy dies behind closed uh, doors. Whether they're the closed doors of a judge's chambers, summarily disposing a case uh, on just written, written papers, uh, or the closed doors of a government bureaucracy where there's no public participation in the decision, or the uh, closed doors of a corporate, uh, corporate office in which uh, important decisions that have impact on the, on the public uh, take place. Um, as one California appellate court put it, participants in secret proceedings quickly lose their perspective, and the quality of the proceedings suffers as a consequence. Popular justice is public justice. So what I want to do today in a short amount of time is four things. One, summarize the evidence of why this is a problem, why the trial is dying in the United States. Uh, remind you much too briefly of what the trial is. Uh, describe our best guesses, and that's all they are at this point, as to why the trial is dying. And enumerate some of the ways in which I believe the, this development spells a catastrophe for our our public uh, culture. Okay. I'm, I'm not a, a statistician, but I need to describe some of the quantitative data to show that we need to pay attention at this point in our, in our public history. Just a couple of statistics. In 1938, about 20 percent of federal civil trials, so including antitrust actions, civil rights actions, probably most importantly, went to trial. By 1962, it had declined to 12 percent. By 2002, the number had sunk to just under 2 percent. So from 20 percent of federal cases being disposed at trial to 2 percent of federal case, civil cases being disposed uh, at trial. So about a 90 percent decline in the number of cases that were resolved at trial at all, whether jury trial or by, or by uh, a bench trial. And the rate was accelerating towards the end of that period, down to the point where now there are so few trials, both criminal and civil, that you really can't get any more of a, of a, of a decline. Um, uh, civil rights cases, because of their personal quality about them, there's a kind of a, more of a higher level of moral significance to them in, than in many other cases, fell from 20 percent of uh, cases going to trial in 1970 to 4 percent in 2002. So only one out of every 25 civil rights trials finds its way to a trial, face-to-face -face hearing, either before a jury or a, or a judge. Uh, in 2002, and again, the numbers are continue to edge, uh, edge downward. The, the percentage of federal criminal cases going to trial fell from about 15% in 1962 to 5% in 2002. So only one out of 20 federal 
uh, criminal cases goes uh, to trial uh, today. Uh, one more localized study uh, found that in 1975, twice as many cases were resolved by trial, face-to-face -face hearing, uh, as by summary judgment. Um, uh, by 2002, three times as many cases were resolved by summary judgment as by trial. And for the non-lawyers among you, su summary judgment is a proceeding in which the court resolves the issue, decides the case, based solely on papers submitted by the, by the lawyers, the affidavits, sometimes deposition transcripts, and then l purely legal argument. There's never a face-to-face -face hearing between a uh, party and his representative and a judge or a, or a, a jury. A number of decisions by our uh, current uh, Supreme Court has made su summary judgment, that proceeding, much more likely to occur than occurred before. And more recently, several decisions of the current Supreme Court, 5-4 decisions typically, have made dispositions on motions to dismiss even earlier than summary judgment, before there were even any discovery or um, uh, uh, any discovery at all, uh, the, the case can be dismissed at that very first stage when basically you just have a complaint and, a, and, and an answer. Um, in the new federal courthouse in Boston that was built at great expense a few years ago, um, the, there were typically seven or eight trials that occurred in each year per courtroom. So they built this wonderful courtroom uh, spending hundreds of millions of dollars uh, and basically, in each of the courtrooms in that trial, there were only seven or eight uh, trials in the entire year uh, in, that, in that courtroom. Um, so uh, only about 13 trials per judge, per federal judge, per year, down about 67 percent since the, the early uh, 60s. State statistics a little harder to come by, but similar developments between, um, two th between 1992 and 2001, so a 10-year period, the number of trials in the 75 most populous counties fell 50 percent, so a 50 percent decline over a 10-year uh, period. Criminal context uh, from 1976 to 2002, the percentage of cases tried by, uh, by a judge or a jury fell over 60 percent in the, st in the state uh, cases. Uh, bench trials and jury trials falling roughly the same amount of uh, time. It was the only part of the legal system that was shrinking. Uh, there are more statutes, more regulations, more case law, more lawyers, more than a million lawyers as the song uh, puts it, more judges, and a higher percentage of GDP going to legal matters, just fewer and fewer face-to-face -face trials, including uh, jury trials. So. So that's, that's, that's number one, so a, a statistical picture of what's happening. Number two uh, would be uh, what are we losing in this uh, process? It takes a lot of effort um, to show that the tr what the trial is for us, and that involves basically undoing the results of law and order and L.A. law and, and uh, TV, TV uh, dramas. Uh, m most of you know from various sources that trials progress from opening statements through direct and cross-examinations in, in the plaintiff's or prosecution's uh, case in chief, then the defendant's case, direct and cross-examination of witnesses, perhaps exhibits, um, and then rebuttal cases, the party with the burden of proof, the plaintiff or the prosecution gets to attempt to rebut the evidence presented by the defendant, and finally closing arguments of the sort that you have uh, just uh, heard. Um, it offers a level of deliberation far better and far more demanding and far more rigorous uh, than congressional hearings or press conferences or even the best uh, journalism where you don't have that uh, point counterpoint attempt to refute the best case presented by, by both sides. Enormously more serious considerations of questions of fact and of law or of, of, of other of, of normative determinations. Uh, the evidentiary requirements of materiality, we say in the law of evidence, that is uh, evidence that is somehow connected with the democratically enact enacted statute that is the basis of most uh, trials. Uh, testimony that has to be in the, based 
as lawyers say, on personal knowledge that is in the language of perception. What did you see? What did you hear? What did you smell? What did you touch? Not what's your opinion? What's your conclusion? What do you think? What's your best guess? But that kind of very focused, precise, concrete evidence. Uh, the rules of the trial require that it be put before the trier fact, the jury, in that kind of uh, demanding form. And young lawyers have a hard time learning how to present evidence in that way because it's discontinuous with the way we talk in, in everyday life. Uh, the requirements of what uh, trial lawyers call foundations, which all, all that means is that the question, how do you know what you're about to tell us, has to be answered before the witness then goes on to say what he's going to say. So the jury has some basis to evaluate the basis, the foundation, if you want, for the witness's uh, knowledge. So those basic parliamentary uh, found uh, elements of the trial are really important. Uh, they keep the trial from looking like uh, the McLaughlin report uh, or uh, to uh, reference one of Northwestern Law School's uh, great graduates, uh, Jerry, the Jerry Springer show. Uh, the, they're very simple but very demanding and they elevate the level of presentation and evaluation of evidence, uh, force it down to the, to the concrete uh, before the kind of arguments that Mr. Darrow just made uh, are, are made. Um, it's what I call, it's con borrowing from, a, from, a, from another writer, consciously structured hybrid of different kind of languages in the trial can realize or actualize a usually dormant but uh, extremely powerful common sense to achieve real insights into the persons and events being trialed. Usually that common sense is anesthetized by mass media journalism in, in many forms, uh, but the trial reactualizes the common sense that actually exists in, in all of us and certainly in groups of people taking a serious issue seriously, uh, which is what happens in, the, in most jury uh, trials. Um, I've tried to give an account of my own experience as a trial lawyer uh, and what uh, the trial does in well-tried cases where there are good lawyers on both sides uh, that is a, a kind of epiphany, a kind of vision as to what is really going on here that occurs in very, uh, very few other contexts and that these institutions and practices really allow to emerge uh, from uh, the, the efforts of, of good lawyers on both sides of, a, of an issue. Uh, it allows for the simultaneous grasps of facts, norms, those truths of the heart that, uh, that Clarence Darrow was, t was talking about, um, and, and uh, laws at the same time and see how they, and allows the jury to appreciate how they relate to one another. Not what the law is, but what the law means in this extremely detailed, specific, concrete set of circumstances that all the other devices of the trial brings, uh, brings to the vision of the, of the, uh, the jury. Uh, and I think that, that allows for an extremely refined grasp of, of what occurs in a given situation. It surely can go wrong, but in, in a well-tried case, uh, this actually uh, takes place and takes place fairly regularly, I think, in American uh, uh, courtrooms. Um, uh, there are moral values. There are common sense moral values intertwined with the narrative structures, the stories. Clarence Dower was a great storyteller. The stories that lawyers tell in opening statements and the much more Spartan kind of stories that witnesses are allowed to tell in, the direct exam in their direct examinations where they were required to say just what they did and, and what they uh, uh, saw. It allows that kind of common sense morality to penetrate through to this very sort of art otherwise artificial kind of uh, set of uh, uh, circumstances. So in opening statements, uh, lawyers try to tell the God's eye, the God's eye story of events, uh, what each lawyer thinks the case really means. And t the phrase you hear in opening statements in most trials is, this is a case about, and then the lawyer finishes that story in a way that says, this is what's really important about this case. Breach of contract, this is a case about a broken promise, for example. So it's connecting up this legal issue to the ordinary sensibilities in the minds and hearts of the, of the, of the jury. Uh, the obsessive detail of direct and cross-examination forces us to ask 
which of those competing stories, those God's eye views, really has more to do with this particular case, the specific uh, case that the jury is actually uh, going to see. That is, th those details where we are given to believe both God and the devil dwell, uh, and in which they contend with each other uh, in, the, in the course of a trial. So again, it refines and elevates common sense judgment well beyond the anesthetized version of common sense that uh, mass media journalism usually propels us uh, into. Uh, obsessive concern with the factual details of the case because the details of the case matter in serious, in serious uh, cases. Um, so this is a, an institution that's rooted in our history, uh, political purpose, the ability of our juries uh, to send a message. It allows our juries to send a message uh, to discourage abuses of power. The jury decides what's most important about the case, whether it's about doing justice in the individual case or, as Darrow sometimes argued, uh, the broader political significance of the case and the need to say something to the uh, bureaucratic institutions that, that uh, within which uh, the law operates. Um, the trial's fierce oppositions that Darrow had really mastered as a trial lawyer is what gives it its power. Uh, the differences in role between lawyer and witness, between lawyer and judge, the differences in language, those free, open, uh, no storytelling moments in opening statement, those rigorous kinds of um, uh, presentations in direct and cross-examination, and then the opportunity to pull it together, both lawyers have an opportunity to pull it together in, in, in closing argument. Those differences in, in structure of the language allows the jury to get around the issue from all kinds of different perspectives and decide what's most important about uh, the case. Uh, and the resolution of the tensions that are involved in those conflicting forms of language um, is for, and the resolution of those tensions is for us justice, because for in our kind of society, it's built up of various kinds of strong tensions in our moral, in our moral culture. Those different languages reflect those different tensions in, I think, in important, uh, important ways. A great anthropologist, Clifford Gertz, uh, argued that real insight usually emerges, in his words, from a continuous tacking between the most local of local details and the most global of global structures in a way that bring them both to view simultaneously. And that's what the trial does practically. It moves from extreme detail to broader considerations, political, moral, and sometimes uh, 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 legal. Uh, and this came as a surprise to me. I didn't expect to find this institution to be so powerful. Uh, and it, it, and I, I found it to be that in my participation of trials here in, basically here in, uh, in Chicago. Uh, I think in the reflective moment, most reflective moments, most good trial lawyers value the experience of participating in a practice that astoundingly in a public practice where power is in, in, in play can actually converge on the practical truth of a, of a, of a given uh, uh, situation. I remember Tom Hanks' speech in Philadelphia uh, uh, d describing basically his surprise that the law of the trial especially can basically converge on something that looks like justice. Um, um, okay, so w uh, why, why are we losing it? Um, so far, just good guesses uh, as to why this, this has, uh, has happened. Uh, and explanations of this sort of thing I think are dangerous because uh, explanations almost inevitably lead to uh, when you say something is caused by something else, a kind of determinism. So this can't be changed because it's the result of very powerful social forces, and you can just sort of give up and let it happen. So explanations you have to hold at arm's length because um, you don't want to slip into a mode of thought where you say, well, vast social forces are going to make the trial disappear. There's nothing we can do about it in our legal culture, in our political culture. There are no spaces of freedom. Uh, we might as well just give up and admit to a, few, a, a, a world in which there are bureaucracies and markets and that's all. Uh, that can't, we can't allow that to happen uh, as, as citizens. Okay, so you can, look at this you can look at this either through a microscope or a telescope in deciding what's, what are the likely causes of this, of this uh, development. 
Okay. So first, microscopically, what are the little changes that have resulted in this dramatic decline in the number of, of trials? First, there's a change in the culture of judging. Uh, what's, and there's been a rise of what's called managerial judges. Uh, judges see themselves as case managers, uh, sometimes muscling settlements, sometimes resolving cases behind closed doors on papers, rather than individuals who preside over this public ritual that is the, the, jury, uh, the jury trial. Uh, judges see themselves as problem solvers and multitaskers and they embrace the dictum that the worst settlement is better than the best, uh, the best uh, trial. In, in their docket managing case disposition to dispose of a case, telling metaphor, uh, they, they tend to evaluate their performance based on the number of cases closed rather than the number of trials that, that take place. Uh, there's a change. Third, there's a change in the culture of lawyering. There are fewer lawyers with the skills and dispositions necessary uh, to try cases. Uh, lo trial lawyers have been replaced by litigators, uh, and litigators are folks who are comfortable and perhaps uh, exclusively comfortable with resolving cases on paper. Uh, so they're paper, paper shufflers rather than the Clarence Darrows uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the world. Leads to end in civil cases, like civil rights cases, it leads to endless discovery uh, and, and so as to avoid ever going to trial resolving cases by the attrition of who can't afford to engage in this discovery process uh, anymore. Easier summary dispositions, thanks to our Supreme Court. Uh, both summary judgment and even earlier at the motion to dismiss the preliminary stage, easier to get rid of cases, dispose of cases, uh, before you ever get to either discovery or a, or a, or a trial. Intensification of the plea bargaining system. Uh, and this is a, a long story, there's a, a book by a, a scholar named Fisher called The Triumph of Plea Bargaining that tells the, tells the story. Basically, higher minimum, higher m proliferation of possible charges, higher minimum and maximum sentences, the ability of prosecutors to engage in charge bargaining. We won't charge you with first degree murder, we'll charge you with manslaughter if you agreed to plea. So probationable offense as opposed to an offense that brings life in, in prison. Uh, so that uh, basically um, the prosecution is in a position to make offers that no one can refuse. Um, and that development has reduced the number of cases uh, tried in the criminal context down to one out of 20 uh, in both federal and state uh, uh, pr uh, cases. Uh, with the blessing of the Supreme Court, the rise of mandatory arbitration. If you own a computer, uh, you might not know this, but if you have a dispute with the computer company, you have agreed to have that case go to arbitration, where there will be repeat, pl where the repeat players, that is the company, will choose the arbitrators, which will take place in a non-public kind of, uh, of, of forum. Um, the economics of the system, uh, um, skeptical of this because the amount of money that goes into the legal system more, more broadly. But we are, I think, as a derivative matter, making trials more and more expensive to do. I think that's a, 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 an effect rather than a cause, but it's a fact, a, a fact of, the, of, our, of life. Trials are not overly long. 60% uh, of federal civil trials are over in two days. 95% uh, are over in four to nine days. So the, the um, O.J. Simpson trial, which is pointed out as the, as the icon of why you don't want to have jury trials, is by far the exceptional trial rather than what actually uh, takes place. You can do quite a bit in two days of face-to-face -face, uh, hearing. So those are the microscopic reasons. Telescopically, social science, you look, draw back and say, what does this development mean in the big picture? Social scientists talk about so-called convergence of modes of social ordering. Uh, this close to the University of Chicago, we can use language like that. Um, it, it eliminates the distinctiveness of different modes of resolving uh, uh, issues. Uh, the law becomes more like bureaucratic or market institutions that surround it. Uh, manage, managerial judging, judges muscling settlements, is bureaucratic. The triumph of plea bargaining means that our criminal justice system is almost completely dominated by two bureaucracies the police bureaucracy extracting confessions and the prosecutorial bureaucracy which is engaged in this 
offer you can't refuse style of, of uh, plea bargaining. So the criminal, the, de the dem democratic element of traditional American criminal justice disappears and is replaced by uh, two bureau bureaucracies operating in, in uh, tandem. And the, the pressure to settle, the enormous pr uh, pressure to settle in civil cases, to plea in criminal cases, allows the bureaucracy and the market to invade the legal order and especially the democratic element of the legal order embedded in the Constitution, the, the, jur uh, the jury trial, both in civil and, and criminal cases, and squeeze it out of an available means of uh, social ordering in the United uh, States. So what disappears is a distinctive region or place where a citizen can appeal to legal or moral principle, uh, usually through his agent, his diplomat, that is a lawyer who knows how to speak in that kind of uh, rather constrained set of circumstances. Uh, and so the big picture is a more bureaucratic, monolithic society where there are fewer countervailing institutions to our corporate and public uh, bureaucracies. I've got to think of the transition of the Roman Empire, from the Roman Republic to the Roman Empire, a more imperial, bureaucratic, uh, single-valued kind of society rather than one with multiple forums with different styles of, 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 of arguing. Um, uh, Another telescopic resolution, and this is deeply cynical, um, I think it was Thoreau who said the, the problem with cynics is that they're right so often. That's what makes you mad about them. Um, the uh, one possible explanation on it from a telescopic point of view is the democratizing of the American jury over the last 40 years through a series of Supreme Court decisions, earlier Supreme Court decisions, uh, more minorities, women, uh, now serve on juries than was the case 50 years ago. So you have a, a, an increasing democratization of the jury pool that would decide jury cases. Uh, when the jury was composed solely of people of the same social class, certainly in the federal system, that, that was institutionalized, but even in, in um, the state systems, uh, there was less to fear on the part of the elites in our society of the jury trial. Uh, today, there is largely irrational, because juries really don't usually operate this way, an irrational fear on the part of this democratized jury of the institutions of the corporate, basically corporate institutions that uh, are trying to steer their cases away from uh, jury, uh, jury trials. Um, so uh, the jury trial, the democratized jury trial, invokes common sense, life world norms, discontinuous perhaps with the kinds of norms that prevail in in boardrooms and in public bureaucracies. And so there's a conflict there with the sources of the values in which uh, important issues can be, uh, can be uh, resolved. Uh, okay, so what's the meaning? So those are the guesses as to why this has happened. So what does it mean? Now, much more could be said on this, but I'm just gonna enumerate uh, a number of con what I think will be the consequences of this, uh, this development. Uh, first, we lose a space within which the harshness of judgments based solely on the mechanical applications of rules can be softened by equitable judgments, judgments of morality and, uh, and equity. Uh, remember how Clarence Darrow said, if, if Haywood is to be hanged, you have to hang him. So it's an appeal to the moral judgment of the individual juror for which the citizen juror takes responsibility. That disappears in a bureaucracy. One, one writer put it famously, uh, bureaucracies are rules by, ruled by nobody. Uh, no one takes responsibility for what bureaucracies do, unlike what occurs, what can occur in a jury trial where the individual jurors take personal responsibility for the judgment that's made. Thomas Green, who uh, taught at University of Michigan for many years, wrote a book called Verdict According to Conscience, which is a history of the English jury uh, and what he argued there was, despite how awful these British criminal trials truly were in the 17th and 18th centuries, at least the fact that they, they occurred in a face-to-face -face context remained, reminded everyone that somehow or other this process has something to do with justice. Once you remove the face-to-face -face nature of, uh, by which illegal issues are resolved, it can become they can become bureaucratic in the, in the bad sense, in which that personal individual responsibility can, can uh, uh, disappear. Second, we'd lose a distinctively American forum 
within which a, a citizen can tell his own story in public and present evidence to support it, regardless of how implausible it is according to the generally accepted norms of the, of the uh, uh, society. Um, and trial lawyers are basically people who can speak in that public context in a rather artificial sentence, but they speak for the person that they, that they represent. We'd lose a forum uh, within, with the devices to reveal what one writer called brutally elementary factual truth. Just the way it was, and you've got to face it. Uh, and that sort of disappears in lots of our public dialogue. This is the way it actually happened. Uh, in our public world, in the world of mass media, that's very hard to get to. And what the trial does is allows some access to that brutally elementary factual truth in a particular uh, case. Has tremendous political meaning. Bentham famously said that falsehood is the handmaiden of injustice. Uh, where there are lots of lies, uh, you're, there's probably injustice uh, uh, afoot. Uh, you'd lose the experience of citizen participation in, in self-government. De Tocqueville's famous word, big fan of the American jury, famous words, the jury service scrapes away the rust of private concern that is the bane of market societies where everyone is pursuing his own self-interest exclusively all, all the, of the time. Uh, participation in what he called the spirit of magistracy. We, we have citizen juror has actual responsibility in a real case where really something is really at stake. He's not just a whining critic of what's going on out there, but it has actual personal responsibility in a public, in a public matter. Uh, it would transfer more and more power, the d death of the trial, more and more power to bureaucratic and corporate elites. It would distort, distort further the norms of settlement. There are certain areas of the law where no cases go to trial, and after a number of years, people are just guessing as to what the case is, so, as lawyers like to say, what it's worth. It's based on earlier settlements rather than any kind of actual evaluation of the value of, of, um, of, of cases. Security litigation, in some cases, child support proceedings are viewed to be, have that quality uh, about them. Uh, killing the trial would eliminate face-to-face -face drama from the, from the legal system. We would feel and understand less about uh, each case. You lose the dramatic quality that I think can, and the tensions that it relies upon that show us more about what's really at stake, what the conflicts are within each individual case. It gets us closer. The trial, I think, gets us closer to what uh, many generations ago, ago people called true law, that is, the real way forward in the individual uh, case. It would render our economic systems more automatic, uh, less moderated or qualified by common sense uh, moral norms. Uh, over the last, we're probably forgetting it already, but over the last five years, the American faith in this purely self-regulating market took a serious hit uh, in, 19, in 2008. Uh, there seemed to be a resurrection of the notion that we can't just rely upon these uh, markets to operate on their own power, that we need s different forms of regulation, and the jury trial is a form of regulation after the fact. That is, the bringing to bear of non-market norms uh, to individual situ uh, situations. Uh, we live in a more bureauc bureaucratized world. Uh, judges would have more raw discretion in the cracks between complex legal rules uh, which really never really eliminate discretion because judges can do whatever they want really uh, with very few constraints when the law is complicated enough because there are more decision points for them to go one way or another if they really want to be result uh, oriented. I think what the trial does is makes it hard for juries to do that because they're so engaged with the reality of the individual case that's before them and have more of a motivation to actually do what's right in the individual uh, in the individual case be less uh, willful. Eleventh, uh, that's what we're at now. Uh, governance, more governance would occur behind closed doors. And finally, we'd be deprived of an important source of knowledge about ourselves and key issues of uh, public concern. Darrow's great trials uh, basically illuminated the uh, conflict between capital and labor 
in a way that newspaper articles never could. And you could see, you'd see example after example of that in American, in, in American history. We'd know less about the effects of asbestos, about cigarettes, and about lead, uh, lead poisoning. Um, uh, it, it's the existence of trials that really bring, because of the factual specificity that emerges, emerges there, that brings us public knowledge of these important uh, issues. Uh, and that all is why, more than the memory of Clarence Darrow's great closing arguments, that we as citizens uh, should not allow the American trial to go gentle into that good night. Thank you. So, um, uh, questions, comments, speeches? <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. The question the question is how this can is there any hope of ch of changing this? Yeah. Uh, that that is a very difficult question. Uh, and it relies upon uh, American citizens in, acting in political forums, legislatures, uh, providing sufficient funding to, um, to support uh, the legal justice system, and especially the somewhat more expensive, uh, the somewhat more ex expensive proceedings that involve a higher level of, of trials. So that they would have to be convinced uh, the American people would have to be convinced that it is a, a price worth paying, that it's, it's worth having a higher level of justice in those, in those uh, forums. You would have to convince, you'd have to um, uh, uh, occasion the kind of self-consciousness that lawyers and judges, or make, make, make real the sort of uh, conviction that lawyers and judges actually have as to the importance of the trial and uh, convince them that this is a slide that needs to be stopped. Uh, it can be stopped by uh, some decisions of appellate courts on some of these doctrinal matters. If the Supreme Court were to change, uh, there, some of the doctrines that are squeezing the trial out of our legal system would, uh, would, could, be, could, be, could be changed. So it's, it's ultimately, Although the jury trial is of constitutional dimension in the United States, so in a sense, uh, something that legislatures can't change, all of the wherewithal to make it really living has to be supported by legislatures, appellate courts, lawyers, and, and judges. So you need a rebirth of, of, of um, uh, commitment to the importance of the institution in American life. And that requires I mean, if you read if you read the Federalist Papers, it, you can one can despair. You know, it's a high level of political discourse. They, they were published originally in newspapers, so this is what Americans were reading and considering the level of political discourse. It, to, today, it's difficult to have a, a, a political discussion about institutions and how important institutions are um, for preserving these essential uh, values. But that's what has to happen, uh, and. Um, you know, uh, one of my uh, favorite uh, sayings is that in these matters, uh, uh, pessimists are cowards and optimists are fools. Uh, that you, to say, well, it's hopeless is, is a cowardly thing. You've got to, we've got to make the effort to, to try to preserve this important institution. But to expect in our political culture, with the power of market institutions and and the, the style of discourse that occurs in most me mass media, that that is likely to be successful, I think, is, is foolish. So I'm afraid I can't give you, uh, I can't answer in any way other than that. Yeah, the, 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 the comment is, is asked me to talk about the role of the defense bar in the criminal context, and particularly uh, the role of the public defenders. Uh, there, there are a good number of public defenders' offices that are excellent around the country. They do great work, very dedicated people, who, although even in those offices, they're overworked. 
um, sometimes to the point of where, where they're uh, asked to do more than they should be allowed to do. Um, but and in many parts of the country, th that th there is not even a organized public defenders kind of system like we have here in, in Cook County. Uh, that defense is done by appointments to underpaid lawyers who have no interest in criminal law at all, uh, but take the appointments because otherwise they'd have nothing else, else to do. So in some ways, our overworked big city public defender's office is, are the best kinds of uh, offices that we have around the United States. Um, and this is another example. It's, it's such a hard sell politically. I mean, the story of the last 50 years is the, the um, involves an increase in the number of criminal cases, an increase of the funding in prosecutors' offices, and a decrease in the amount of funding that, that goes to the public defenders' offices around the, uh, the country. And that's part of the squeezing of democratic institutions, the jury trial, by market, uh, by market forces. Um, and it has resulted in uh, the mechanization of this assembly line form of resolution of criminal cases. It's another pressure. We have great formal institutions the, in the fifth, sixth, and seventh amendments of the Constitution, but what we can, what, what can happen is they can be squeezed by underfunding and by bureaucratic pressure, and that's, that's what we have in, the, in our criminal justice system, and the unwillingness to fund public defender's offices are in, an important part of that. Politicians, I mean, th this is why uh, optimists are fools. Politicians have to be able to stand up and say, uh, people accused of crime have a right to a, a defense that is competent and where the lawyer has enough time and resources to actually present a defense in order to prevent the rash of false convictions that, um, that here in Cook County, but throughout the country, uh, uh, we've, we've experienced, even in the most important cases, even in capital cases. Sir, oh, ma'am. Uh, that, well, that's true too, but it's part of the same part of this, uh, the, the, the comment was that judges are under pressure to move their cases, to dispose of their cases, and probably we need more judges as well as more public defenders, and that's true too. It's part of the same story, the need to provide more resources to these important public uh, institutions. Uh, um, every, everyone uh, can become self-interested, uh, maybe it's inevitable. I mean, prosecutors want a higher conviction rate, so they want fewer trials where they could actually lose, and they want more pleas where they can't lose, uh, so they can run on a very high conviction rate. Judges, who are sometimes evaluated by their disposition rate, uh, have an interest in looking good by those bureaucratic uh, measures. In, in fact, uh, moving cases in a rigorous way, deliberate way, to trial it's not so clear, and there are some studies that suggest this, that that really takes more time. If you, if you allow more time for discovery in civil cases, civil rights cases, and allow the case to just go on forever, uh, more resources get poured into those. The, trial, the, the case stays pending for a longer period of time, and you may un, end up costing more and taking more judicial resources than a, a crisp, well-tried case earlier in this process with a sensible amount of discovery. Any judge has a lot of control over any case, though. So if the judge wants something to go to trial or doesn't want it to go to trial, that's a, a key. It, it is, it, it's part of the culture of judging that I mentioned, that if you think you're a manager rather than uh, someone who's, whose primary task is to preside over and preserve this important traditional democratic institution, you, you can slide into that bureaucratic style of thinking. My job is to have a higher disposition rate, which means pressure more early settlements and uh, allow for continuances for the discovery that will result in settlements because people will be worn down. Um, those bureaucratic pressures are on prosecutors and on, on judges, um, and uh, that it, take, it takes a lot of gumption to cut against them. I think it can be kind of 
it can, they can be resisted by people with a kind of uh, understanding and, of and commitment to the values that this institution involves. And so once again, I'm, I'm preaching. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, it will always be true. I, I, the, the, the notion is, the, the comment was, there's pressure by insurance carriers uh, to get rid of cases early uh, because they do a pure cost-benefit analysis and let's get it done with. Um, it will always be true, and it's not a bad thing, that most cases settle, but that 98% of cases settle or are resolved on summary matters, it, that, that's not a good thing. Um, so th that, that there is a significant level of settlement is not really offensive, I think, to important values, but that there really is no choice in the matter by virtue of the pressures of the system um, does, I think, offend these, these central, central values that we have. Sir. The, 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 co the comment is from a retired journalist who uh, uh, urges that lawyers uh, exploit the inherently dramatic nature of the trial and perhaps their ability to present these issues in, in, in dramatic ways such that uh, uh, citizens appreciate the importance of, of this issue. And um, I think that's right. And, and he also gives me an assignment for my next book uh, to, um, uh, to, to write a book that describes w what it is that we as a people or a citizenry have learned from our trials uh, and to present that in a kind of dramatic way. It seems I need to write a screenplay, perhaps, rather than a book, uh, because uh, movies probably have more uh, impact than books do. And I'll have to start thinking about screenplays rather than university press books, I think, if I'm going to have the effect that you're, de that you're describing. But, ma'am. My brother. Ah, sorry. He's your brother? He writes, yeah. He writes screenplays, too. Ah. The, yeah, the, the comment is uh, that many people who are called to jury duty don't serve, and I think that's a real problem. I, I think that uh, fewer people should be excused from uh, jury service. If you show up and you're willing to serve, you should serve, absent some um, absent some uh, serious reason why you can't serve on a particular uh, case. My, my, my uh, brothers uh, in the trial world of the, of, uh, the trial bar uh, are jealous to preserve their peremptory challenges uh, because they think that uh, you can't rely on a judge to make fair judgments about who should be excused and not, so you, ne you need absolute discretion in that, in that regard. But I think, I think it is 
um, it's a, it, it, it is an injustice that people who, who show up and are willing to serve uh, don't. And I think there should be fewer reasons why individuals who are willing to be jurors don't serve uh, as jurors. I think it's an important part of, of um, our, our important responsibility and privilege uh, of, of citizenship, and we should all do it more. Are you related to the last two uh, speakers? No. No. Okay. You have to speak up a little. Yeah, the, the question, as I understand it, is asked me to comment on the, the, uh, in, the, the, the lack of uh, the, the, the decreasing number of trials and the, with the sort of humanity that's brought to bear in, a, in the decision of a trial and the increasing of increases in mandatory minimum and the, the um, uh, expansion of the number of convictions that take place and the length of, of services. So, uh, the, the new Jim Crow phenomenon, for example, and the fact that uh, the United States astoundingly uh, Im imprisons a million people and keeps another uh, significant number under some, some form of probation, way out of relationship to that of the, of the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the, the Western world. Um, well, one of, the, one of the results of this is that decisions, individual decisions and individual cases are made, as one person put it, sort of from 50,000 feet. Uh, we have mechanical sets of sentencing guidelines. They are imposed. Uh, there's been some relief from this recently, but they're imposed in a kind of mechanical way by judges who can't exercise discretion in individual cases. So individualized justice can't really be done. I think it's wrong that jurors in criminal cases are unaware of the sentences that, are, that result from the convictions that they're asked to provide. I think uh, unlike in civil cases where they award the amount of damages or results in those cases, in the criminal context, um, the, the sentences to be imposed, which are mandatory minimums uh, in, in many cases, uh, are imposed uh, after a conviction when the jury is completely unaware of the consequences of a conviction. And sometimes they are shocked when they learn of what the actual uh, period of incarceration that will follow a conviction on which, uh, which they have provided, which they've, which they've decided to impose is. So I think that's wrong. It, it prevents the kind of individualized justice, humane justice if you want, that uh, responsible jurors are in a position are, and are completely competent to engage in. It's part of the bureaucratization of the system and the, and the mass political nature of our criminal justice system uh, really since the late 70s and the, the way in which it's become a public issue in a kind of um, a mass media way that, that distorts really what's, what's, what's at issue, I think. Thank you.